Hello there, good evening Facebookers and YouTubers. Very good evening and welcome along to Live Irish Myths. This is episode 87. Oh, that was a shock. This Misha Antone. My name is Anthony Murphy of Mythical Ireland. You are tuned in for the next hour or thereabouts to Live Irish Myths, a series we have been doing uh, since the first COVID restrictions were announced in Ireland on the evening of Thursday the 12th of March and uh, I've been live streaming every day since then. Hope you're all keeping safe and well in the current pandemic and that everybody is in good form. On YouTube tonight, Daisy Peters says, have a beautiful afternoon slash evening, my dear Tua, the Mythflix, Fulcha, Anthony and everyone. Here we go to one more episode of Fairy Tales. I'm looking forward to the second part. Great to have you along, Daisy. As always, very welcome. Erica Rivertree says, Banachti o Louisville, Kentucky. To am amsher che agus greenvar. Conas ta tu tome gama. Erica, uh, but uh, on I'm sure show Toshe on a scamalock in you it's uh, uh, cloudy uh, August Guifer and windy and a little bit on the cool side actually very very big change since the beginning of the week but we're not complaining not much in the way of rain which is good uh, Naomi Serafina says Trinonawa Anthony August Antua Umlon Fairy and Folk Tales of Ireland by the marvellous Mr Yates is one of my favourite books of all time and it's lovely to hear it read aloud. Glad to have you along, Naomi, and uh, glad you're enjoying it. Falcha. Mandy McCurl says, hello, everyone, and hope you're all keeping well. Good night for fire here. Yes, indeed. It's very, very grey out. But anyway, nice day to be in the library. John Main says, Banachtio, San Francisco. F -f -f San Francisco for August Guifer and you. So we're sharing the same weather. <clears throat> Cold and windy today, says John in San Francisco. Jackie Stevenson says, hello. Anthony and the two are ready for another fabulous episode. Brilliant stuff. Falls you, Jackie. Great to see you along. And on Facebook, Morgan Daimler is the first watcher tonight, according to the notifications. Morgan will be joining me, as you know, in episode 90 on Tuesday evening, when we will be talking about the emergence of fairy lore from the old stories of the Tua de Danon. Great to see you, Morgan. Trononawa. Donna Firer says, so glad to be here from Maryland. Falcha, Donna, it's great to see you also. Steve Martinson says, yay, hello, Anthony and Mythflix clan. May ye, ye all be well and safe. Jigrich, uh, Steve. Melanie Lynn is watching Falcha, Melanie. Veronica Casey says, hey, Anthony and all. Falcha, Veronica. Aaron Durrett is watching. Alex Casterton says, good evening, Anthony. And to it. ready for part two of Fay Tales. Nick Eska Casterton says, hi, Anthony and the two are from a wet and rainy Albion. Yes, indeed. That's the kind of weather we've had this week. Danilo Paparello says, Ciao, Anthony from Italy. Ciao, Danilo. Falce. Freyas Johom says, Trononoa Anton Augustua. I believe in fairies. Fantastic, Freya. Lovely to see you. Barbara Barney says, Hi, Anthony. Giagrich. Porig Okomiski is watching. Hello, Porig. Hope you're well. Ralph Waldron says, Good evening from Athlete Central. Great stuff. More fairy stories. Brilliant stuff, Ralph. Margaret Ring is watching. Brilliant stuff. Falce, Margaret. Mike and Jeanette Naylor are in. Princeton in New Jersey and say good afternoon to everybody. Falcha to both of you. Rowan Grove says greetings. Cool and cloudy in Colorado. Hoping for rain showers this afternoon, but hopefully no hail. All hail the rain. Never mind. Melanie Lynn says more fairies. Hello, Anthony and Tua. Falcha, Melanie. Jack Durkin says hi, Anthony and Evan. Gia Glitch, Jack. Adina Sparks says hello, Anthony and all the Tua. Falcha, Adina. Margaret Ring says good evening, Anthony and all the lovely Tua. Banachti, Margaret. Marie Cronin says, hello, everyone. Giagrich, Marie. Lots of rain in Albion, says Alex, but nice and cool on the bright side. Always a silver lining. It was lovely to see some rain here in Dundalk after the terrible fires up in the Cooley Mountains. Yes, indeed, a great relief, Porig. Dampen things down a little bit. Francis Smith says, hi, Tua from Slaunia. Uh, that's slain in County Meath. Falchus, Francis. Nora Gaffney O'Connor says, Giagrich, Anthony Agasson, Tua, all of them. She's calling us lovely. There you go. <laughs> Good evening, Anthony, and beautiful to a cold in the water this morning. I'd say it was. Gillian Smith is here, and good evening, Gillian. Falche. Doris O'Hara says hello, Anthony, and to a cold and rainy in Heidelberg today. Looks like it's a popular theme across the world. Anne McCallum says hi, Anthony. Happy Saturday. When I was just a wee one, my great granny, who my great granny, who can we used to put a saucer of milk out on the windowsill. Ah, brilliant for the for the little one for the for the good people. To Vermont says Patricia Healy Sullivan just found my spot. Thank you for the fairies. Make yourself comfortable, Patricia. Tina Trana says much love to a a nice partially sunny day here in Moscow, Idaho. Falcha Tina, 
Veronica Casey says, ooh, looking forward to Tuesday. There you go. Uh, Megan Walter says, good afternoon to a Falcha, Megan. Nikki Hart says, good evening all. Hope that you're all doing well. Hello, Anthony, from a grey and gloomy Bela Hummelsloa, County Galway. That's Ballina Slow. Good evening, Nikki. Yes, indeed, seems to be grey all across the way. Mariana Dunn says, greetings from sunny Virginia. So there you go, it's sunny somewhere. Maria Rodriguez Doyle says, hello, how are you? Love from Spain. Good evening to you, Maria. Nice to see you. Lorna Evers Monaghan is here. Falcha Lorna. Cheryl Ann McFetridge says, Cheers, Anthony and Tua from Boston. Brilliant stuff. Linda Sager Kazalski says, greetings from Portsmouth, Virginia, USA. Hot, sunny day here. So there you go. It's not raining everywhere. Good stuff, Linda. Nice to see you. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, oh. What's going on there? Hmm, something strange happened there. Pat Rowan is in the house. Falls you, Pat. Tom King says, good evening, Anthony and all the lovely Tua. More fairy stories. Very much enjoying this one. Always a great pleasure to have you along, Tom, from just over the way in Slane. And there's a few Slaners watching this evening. Marie Bisgard says, hello from Copenhagen. Trinona what, Marie? Laura O'Domitroy says, good evening. Happy tribe. Blessing from Blessington. I'm writing a book for children about fairies. Thank you for these valuable stories. Brilliant stuff, Laura. The best of luck with it. Uh, Jonas F. is trying to sell us uh, herpes cures. Uh, you know what to do, folks. Uh, uh, report and block, and that will soon get rid of the spammers. Long T Men OC says, Hi, Anthony. Greetings to the two of Falcha. Long T, nice to see you. Maggie Bevan says, Good evening. Turn on the what, Maggie? Falcha. Uh, Alwyn Roy Badziak says, Hi to everyone from Berkshire. Good evening, Alwyn. Falcha. Judy McQueen says, Hello, Geogritch. Vicky Wallace Southerl says, Hello, my lovely friends. Good evening to you, Vicky and Evan, if you're there. Falcha, you're very welcome along. Oh, I just scrolled through a whole lot of messages unmistakably. Oh, my finger seems to have some magic in it tonight. Mm, back up. Fiorenza to Togni. I'm, uh, to Togni? I, I, yes, I can't pronounce that. Uh, I know it because it's, it's an Italian pronunciation. But Fiorenza says good evening from a cloudy Bergamo in Italy. Good evening, Fiorenza. Ciao, Falcia. Paddy Henry, Henry Paddy even, is in the house and says hi to a hi, Anthony. Falcia, Henry. Cars Peel says hello from Oregon. Always nice to have the Oregoners in the house, Falcia. Welcome along. Alex Casterton says, my Westy Finn has jump, just jumped up and lay across me. He's come to listen to. Brilliant. I like it. Pat Rowan says, yay, Saturday. Hello, Anthony Antua. I guess that means you're not on the road today driving the truck, Pat, which is great. Elaine Dent Lingenfelter says, hello again from Whitney, Texas. Falcha, Elaine, welcome along. Kirsten Salisbury says, just planted my fairy garden. Hi, everyone. Brilliant stuff, Kirsten. Geoglitch. Judy Ann says hello from southern, sorry, northern Ontario, Canada. Sunny. Well, that's always a good start, isn't it? Maeve Fina Callahan says greetings from Portland, Oregon. There's another Oregoner in the house. Falcha Maeve, you're welcome along. Martin Dohany. Hello, Anthony, and all the two are from a windy South Kilkenny, starting a week's holidays. Brilliant. Some walking, reading, gardening, and Mythflix. Sounds like a great week, Martin. Jealous. Rowan Grove says troll reported and blocked. And that's the thing to do. Thank you, folks. Stephen Greer says, hello from Little Rock, Arkansas. Slaunchy. Slaunchy indeed, Stephen. Banachty. Laura Lee says, hello. Massive thunderstorms in Utah today. Laura, don't take this personally, but please keep them there. <laughs> don't send them this way. Jim Conway says he's on the shore of Loch Ney. Falcha Jim from Loch Ney. Tom Lawler is in the house. Rain and cold in Tipperary, L and L. Good evening indeed, Tom. Always a pleasure to see you. Evan is waving. Hello, Evan. Hello, indeed. Susan Scott says, hello, Falcha, Susan. Debbie Daly says, greetings from San Jose, California. I'm so excited that your new Grange Monu Monument to Immortality just arrived. Cheers. Delighted to hear that, Debbie. I hope you really enjoy it, as I'm sure you will. Uh, Neil, who is Mellow Nello, says, hi, Anthony. Made it to the live chat tonight. I don't always make it these days, but I do catch up after. Yes, indeed, Neil. That's perfectly OK. Life goes on, as they say, and it's good to see you. Mm. Anna Beth Blees Braswell says hello and good afternoon from North Carolina. Hello, Anna Beth. You're very welcome along to Live Irish Myths. Grace Walker says hi all from a hot Long Island NY. Hello, Vicky and Evan. Good evening, Grace. Vicky Wallace Southall says Oregon in the house. Yes, indeed. There's tons of Oregoners. 
Some technical difficulties, but I'm here, says Susan. Maybe it was the fairies. Kelly Edmiston says, hey there, you've not answered my questions about altars and offerings, offerings to the good people. I'm sorry, Kelly, I, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not able to keep on top of it all, I'm afraid. Uh, you would not believe the amount of people who are messaging and emailing me. Uh, and it's just very difficult to catch up with it all, especially uh, when there are other things going on. So please accept my apologies. Nora Gaffney O'Connor, it's true, my Jack Russell just curled herself up in armchair with ears pricked up and listening. Brilliant. Nice to hear it. Good evening to your Jack Russell, who doesn't have a name. Uh, I'm only joking. I'm sure your Jack Russell has a lovely name, Nora. <laughs> you might tell us. Jerry Andrade says, hello, Anthony, and to a Mr. Couple playing catch up. So good as ever. No problem, Jerry. Always a pleasure to see you. Lewis Hanvey Wilson says, greetings from Houston in Texas. Lois, sorry, Lois. Lois, it's lovely to see you from Houston. Always welcome the Texans into the house. Uh, Alan Aubrey says hello from Albuquerque in New Mexico. Good evening, Alan. Uh, nice to meet you. Oh. And God's Time Nyerhovwo is also trying to sell us something. Uh, you know what to do. Uh, block and report. These uh, spammers uh, think that we're all going to fall for their scams. We're not. We're just going to boot you out of the house. Kick up the backside, out the door. Kimberly Halligan says hi from New York. Summer showers here. Not a bad complaint. Helps the grass to grow. Barbara Kling said made it in time. I missed yesterday's live, but caught the video later. Love fairy stories. Great to see you, Barbara. Welcome along. Jennifer Foley says hello, everyone. Gia Glitch. Aaron Durrett says more spam reported. And Alex, second troll reported and blocked. Thank you, folks, for helping with that. That's the only way we can do it. Bernie Courtney says good evening. Tronoa, Bernie. Cecilia McQuaid says, hello from up north where the fairies are rife. Indeed. Hello, Cecilia. Okay. Wow. Um, who did I miss uh, on the uh, YouTube feed? Jackie Stevenson we had. William Fitzgerald. I wonder, do the fairies believe in humans? <laughs> jo Josie, well, they do. They believe in uh, ma making fun of them a lot. Josie Weatherford says, Geoglitch, sending love and light to you all. Thanks, Josie. And right back to you. Uh, uh, Solos August Graw. Uh, D Lynn says a, a break in it, a break in it all for a simple story. Thanks, no problem. Mark Guinan says Mark here from Burr, coming home from the bog, third night listening in. Great stuff. Very well, you're very welcome along, Mark. Thanks for joining in. Dan B is watching from Finglas in Dublin. Dan, it's a great pleasure to have you along. Uh, Marcus and Rachel, who are Irish technical thinkers, say greetings, everyone. Sitting by the snapping, crackling fire, drinking blueberry mead. Nothing is more mysterious and fascinating than the fairies here in our magical land. Couldn't agree with you more. Uh, our little dog is a Russell Terrier and she's called Erin. <laughs> Lovely name. The Woodsies in Monaster Boys are saying good evening. Falsha Woodsies, how are you all? Paula Grogan says hello everyone from rainy London. You're very welcome along, Paula. Make yourself comfortable. William Fitzgerald says it's very sad for those fairies who don't believe. Uh... Uh, Don Hilton says Hi everyone, love to you all from sunny Lancashire We too have huge fairy rings That academics ignore So wonderful and full of positive fairy energies Similar stories of Ireland Paul Garron says Paul here, driving tonight Keep her between the ditches, Paul, pay attention And uh, hopefully you can hear us And that's all you need to do, isn't it? Good stuff Thank you folks for dealing with the... Uh, Dealing with the spammers, I'll just make a slight adjustment to this camera. I think it's just a little bit crooked. Margaret Kiernan says, hi, everyone, on this grey, chilly evening. Yes, indeed, it is grey. <sighs> so let's just take a note here. This is episode 87, and we are just on 14 minutes. Okay, just a reminder uh, that if you're buying or you're intending to buy the 2020 edition of Island of the Setting Sun uh, and you want it in August rather than November, uh, then you're better off to get it from the Mythical Ireland website. The downside of that is that postage is a little bit more expensive from Ireland. But the upshot, of course, is that you get a signed copy and you get it in August instead of November. If you order it uh, via Amazon, and it's okay if you do it that way, there's no problem with that. But just beware that they won't have copies until November. So if you're going to order it, order it at the link that I'm about to paste in. Uh, beneath the video. Also to say thank you very much to all the Mythical Ireland patrons over at mythicalireland.com. Just to let you know what's going on over there, uh, in the past few days, two two uh, sort of patron exclusives would be a, a video 
uh, an overfly of the Brunabonia landscape during the recent drought uh, in high definition, and also a 1,300-word blog post about the ancient origins or the ancient uh, the ancientness of the Mill Mountain Drahada, which is supposed to be uh, a prehistoric burial mount. So if you're interested in becoming a patron, it's patreon.com forward slash mythical Ireland. And uh, thank you to all the patrons and especially those who have become patrons in the past week. Uh, your uh, your uh, support is very, very greatly appreciated. Yvette Tillema is in the house, says hi, Pua. Hi, Anthony Falcha. Margaret Kiernan says, my Jack Russell is named Molly. Hello, Molly. Great stuff. Okay, so tonight, actually last night we did a few stories. Tonight I'm going to give you just one. But remember that there's so much fairy lore that we could do several episodes about the fairies. And to be honest, I think we'll come back to it. Regardless, uh, we will come back uh, in uh, on Tuesday with Morgan Daimler for what should be a very, very, very interesting and exciting episode. Okay. Christina Zaba says, hello, Anthony and everyone. Fault you, Christine. Christina, sorry. Marcella Logue says, good evening, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Marcella. How are you keeping? Hope you're safe and well. This is literally translated from the Irish by Douglas Hyde, Ty Douglas Hyde, who we said last night was the first president of Ireland. Of course, he probably recorded this long before he was president. Tygo Cain, or in Irish, Tygo Cahan, and the corpse. I found it hard to place Mr. Douglas Hyde's magnificent story among the ghosts or the fairies. It is among the fairies on the grounds that all these ghosts and bodies were in no manner ghosts and bodies, but pishogues, fairy spells. One often hears of these visions in Ireland. I have met a man who had lived a wild life like the man in the story till a vision came to him in the county one dark night in no ways in no way so terrible a vision as this, but sufficient to change his whole character. He will, he will not go out at night. If you speak to him suddenly, he trembles. He has grown timid and strange. He went to the bishop and was sprinkled with holy water. It may have come as a warning, said the bishop. Yet great theologians are of the opinion that no man ever saw an apparition, for no man would survive it. There you go. And here's the story. Hope you're all comfortable. Pull up a chair. Grab yourself a brew. There was once a grown-up lad in the county Leitrim, and he was strong and lively, and the son of a rich farmer. His father had plenty of money, and he did not spare it on the son. Accordingly, when the boy grew up, he liked sport better than work, and, as his father had no other children, he loved this one so much that he allowed him to do in everything just as it pleased himself. He was very extravagant, and he used to scatter the gold money as another person would scatter the white. He was seldom to be found at home, but if there was a fair or a race or a gathering within 10 miles of him, you were dead certain to find him there. Yet Pishogues, P, well, it's actually spelled P-I-S-H-O-G-U-E-S -E here, but I think that's the Irish spelling, Megan. Yes. And he seldom spent a night in his father's house, but he used to be always out rambling. And like Sean Bui long ago, there was Gra Koch Colleen in the love of every girl in the breast of his shirt. And it's many's the kiss he got and he gave, for he was very handsome, and there wasn't a girl in the country that would fall in love with him, only for him to fasten his two eyes on her. And it was for that someone made this ran on him. Fioch on Rogera Igira Poige. Ni hyunguntus more a vet marata Eglanavunch a govnuya darnan nagronioige Amus is a nish is na hula sala. I.e., look at the rogue, it's for kisses he's rambling. It's much, it's, it isn't much wonder, for that was his way. He's like an old hedgehog, at night he'll be scrambling. From this place to that, but he'll sleep in the day. And I know there's probably a few of you nodding, going, yeah, I knew, I know I knew a few lads like that, all right. At least, sorry, at last, he became very wild and unruly. He wasn't to be seen day or night in his father's house, 
but always rambling or going on his Kaylee night visit from place to place. Now, that's spelled K-I-L-E-E, but of course, that is an anglicization of the word C-E-F-A-D-A, I-L-I-F-A-D-A, Kaylee, which means a, a, a dance or a uh, a gathering where people, uh, you know, play music and dance from place to place and from house to house so that the old people used to shake their heads and say to one another, it's easy seeing what will happen to the land when the old man dies. His son will run it through in a year and it won't stand him that long itself. He used to be always gambling and card playing and drinking, but his father never minded his bad habits and never punished him. But it happened one day that the old man was told that the son had ruined the character of a girl in the neighbourhood. And he was greatly angry. And he called the son to him and said to him quietly and sensibly, Avic, he says he, you know, I loved you greatly up to this. And I never stopped you from doing your choice thing, whatever it was. And I kept plenty of money with you. And I always hoped to leave you the house and the land. And all I had after myself would be gone. But I heard a story of you today that has disgusted me with you. I cannot tell you the grief that I felt when I heard such a thing of you. And I tell you now plainly that unless you marry that girl, I leave house and land and everything to my brother's son. Which, you know, in, in olden times, uh, the prospect of being left house and land was very important, of course, because, well, because of because of our history and our history in particular of not being able to own land and being kicked off our land and for it to be threatened to be given to another member of the family who wasn't a direct descendant uh, was a big deal. I never could leave it to anyone who would make so bad a use of it as you do yourself, deceiving women and coaxing girls. Settle with yourself now whether you'll marry that girl and get my land as a fortune with her or refuse to marry her and give up all that was coming to you and tell me in the morning which of the two things you have chosen. Oh, Domnu Shiri, father, you wouldn't say that to me, and I such a good son as I am. Who told you I wouldn't marry the girl, says he. But his father was gone, and the lad knew well enough that he would keep his word too, and he was greatly troubled in his mind. For as quiet and as kind as the father was, he never went back of a word that he had once said. And there wasn't another man in the country who was harder to bend than he was. The boy did not know rightly what to do. He was in love with the girl indeed, and he hoped to marry her some time or other. But he would much sooner have remained another while as he was, and follow on at his old tricks. Drinking, sporting, and playing cards. And, along with that, he was angry that his father should order him to marry and should threaten him if he did not do it. Isn't my father a great fool, says he to himself. I was ready enough and only too anxious to marry Mary. And now since he threatened me, faith, I have a great mind to let it go another while. His mind was so much excited that he remained between two notions as to what he should do. He walked out into the night at last to cool his heated blood <laughs> and went on to the road. He lit a pipe and as the night was fine, he walked and walked on until the quick pace made him begin to forget his trouble. Isn't that what we do sometimes, folks, when we're a little bit annoyed or upset? We go out for a walk and after a little bit of walking, it calms us down. The night was bright and the moon half full. There was not a breath of wind blowing and the air was calm and mild. He walked on for nearly three hours when he suddenly remembered that it was late in the night and time for him to turn. Musha, I think I forgot myself, says he. It must be near 12 o'clock now. The word was hardly out of his mouth when he heard the sound of many voices and the trampling of feet on the road before him. I don't know who can be out so late at night as this. And on such a lonely road, he said to himself. He stood listening and he heard the voices of many people talking, th talking through other. But he could not understand what they were saying. Oh, what a, says he. I'm afraid it's not Irish or English they have. It can't be. They're Frenchmen. <laughs> he went on a couple of yards farther. And he saw well enough by the light of the moon a band of little people coming towards him. 
and they were carrying something big and heavy with them. Oh, murder, says he to himself. Sure, it can't be that, they, that, that they're the good people that's in it. Every rib of hair that was on his head stood up, and there fell a shaking on his bones, for he saw that they were coming to him fast. He looked at them again and perceived that there were about 20 little men in it, and there was not a man at all of them higher than about three feet or three feet and a half, and some of them were grey and seemed very old. He looked again, but he could not make out what was the heavy thing they were carrying until they came up to him, and then they all stood around about him. They threw the heavy thing down on the road, and he saw on the spot that it was a dead body. He became as cold as the death, and there was not a drop of blood running in his veins when an old little grey manine came up to him and said, Isn't it lucky we met you? Tygo came. Poor Tyg could not bring out a word at all, nor open his lips, if he were, if he were to get the word for it. And so he gave no answer. Tyg O'Cain, said the little grey man again, isn't it timely you met us? Tyg could not answer him. Tyg O'Cain, says he, the third time, isn't it lucky and timely that we met you? But Tyg remained silent, for he was afraid to return an answer, and his tongue was as if it was tied to the roof of his mouth. The little grey man turned to his companions, and there was joy in his bright little eye. And now, says he, Tyg O'Cain hasn't a word. We can do with him what we please. Tyg, Tyg, says he, you're living a bad life and we can make a slave of you now and you cannot withstand us for there's no use in trying to go against us. Lift that corpse. Tyg was so frightened that he was only able to utter the two words, I won't. And for as frightened as he was, he was obstinate and stiff, the same as ever. Tygo Cain won't lift the corpse, said the little manine with a wicked little laugh. <laughs> For all the world, like the breaking of a lock or dry kippeens, and with a little harsh voice like the striking of a cracked bell. Tygo Cain won't lift the corpse, make him lift it. And before the word was out of his mouth, they had all gathered around poor Tyg. And they all talking and laughing through other. Tyg tried to run from them, but they followed him. And a man of them stretched out his foot before him as he ran, so that Tyg was thrown in a heap on the road. Then before he could rise up, the fairies caught him, some by the hands and some by the feet. And they held him tight in a way that he could not stir with his face against the ground. Six or seven of them raised the body then and pulled it over to him and left it down on his back. The breast of the corpse was squeezed against Tyg's back and shoulders, and the arms of the corpse were thrown around Tyg's neck. Then they stood back from him a couple of yards and let him get up. He rose, foaming at the mouth and cursing, and he shook himself, thinking to throw the corpse off his back. But his fear and his wonder were great when he found that the two arms had a tight hold round his own neck and that the two legs were squeezing his hips firmly and that, however strongly he tried, he could not throw it off any more than a horse can throw off its saddle. He was terribly frightened then and he thought he was lost. Oh, hon, forever, he said to himself. It's the bad life I'm leading that has given the good people this power over me. I promise to God and Mary, Peter and Paul, Patrick and Bridget, that I'll mend my ways for as long as I have to live if I come clear out of this danger and I'll marry the girl. The little grey man came up to him again and said to him, Now, Tygeen, says he, you didn't lift the body when I told you to lift it and see how you were made to lift it. Perhaps when I tell you to bury it, you won't bury it till you're made to bury it. Anything at all that I can do for your honour, said Tyg. <laughs> I'll do it, says he for, he, for he was getting sense already. And if it had not been for the great fear that was on him, he never would have let that civil word slip out of his mouth. The little man laughed a sort of laugh again. You're getting quiet now, Tyg, says he. I'll go bail, but you'll be quiet enough before I'm done with you. 
Listen to me now, Tygo Cain. And if you don't obey me in all I'm telling you to do, you'll repent it. You must carry with you this corpse that is on your back to Chample Damus, and you must bring it into the church with you and make a grave for it in the very middle of the church. Mm -hmm. And you must raise up the flags and put them down the very same way. And you must carry the clay out of the church and leave the place as it was when you came so that no one could know that there had been anything changed. Paul Campbell says, this is episode 87, I understand, on the trot. Yes, this is episode 87. Without a break, we've, we've been going for 87 consecutive days since the 12th of March. But that's not all. Maybe that the body won't be allowed to be buried in the church. Perhaps some other man has the bed. And if so, it's likely he won't share it with this one. If you don't get leave to bury it in Chample Damus, you must carry, to, carry, carry it to Carrick Odd Vigorus to bury it in the churchyard there. And if you don't get it into that place, take it with you to Chample Ronan. And if that churchyard is closed on you, take it to Imlog Fodda. And if you're not able to bury it there, you've no more to do than to take it to Kilbreda. To Kilbreda. And you can bury it there without hindrance. I cannot tell you what one of these churches, what, what one of these churches is the one where you will have, have leave to bury that corpse under the clay. But I know that it will be allowed you to bury him at some church or other of them. If you do this work rightly, we will be thankful to you and we will have no cause to grieve. But if you are slow or lazy, believe me, we shall take satisfaction of you. When the grey little man had done speaking, his comrades laughed and clapped their hands together. Click, click, whee, whee, they all cried. Go on, go on. You have eight hours before you till daybreak. And if you haven't this man buried before the sun rises, you're lost. They struck a fist and a foot behind on him and drove him in on the road. He was obliged to walk and to walk fast, for they gave him no rest. He thought himself that there was not a wet path or a dirty boreen or a crooked contrary road in the whole country that he had not walked that night. The night was at times very dark, and whatever there would come a, whenever there would come a cloud across the moon, he could see nothing. And then he used often to fall. Sometimes he was hurt and sometimes he escaped, but he was obliged always to rise on the moment and to hurry on. Sometimes the moon would break out clearly and then he would look behind him and see the little people following his back. And he heard them speaking among themselves, talking and crying out and screaming like a flock of seagulls as if he was to... As as if he was to save his soul, he never understood as much as one word of what they were saying. He did not know how far he had walked when at last one of them cried out to him, Stop here! He stood and they all gathered round him. Do you see those withered trees over there? said the old boy to him again. Champel Damus is among those trees and of course Champel is an old Irish word for church or chapel. And you must go in there by yourself, for we cannot follow you or go with you. We must remain here. Go on boldly. Tig looked from him, and he saw a high wall that was in places half broken down, and an old grey church on the inside of the wall, and about a dozen withered old trees scattered here and there around it. There was neither leaf nor twig on any of them, but their bare, crooked branches were stretched out like the arms of an angry man when he threatens. He had no help for it, but was obliged to go forward. He was a, a couple of hundred yards from the church, but he walked on and never looked behind him until he came to the gate of the churchyard. The old gate was thrown down, and he had no difficulty in entering. He turned then to see if any of the little people were following him, but there came a cloud over the moon, and that night became so dark that he could see nothing. He went into the churchyard and he walked up the old grassy pathway leading to the church. When he reached the door, he found it locked. The door was large and strong and he did not know what to do. At last, he drew out his knife with difficulty and stuck it in the wood to try if it were rotten, but if it was not. But it was not. 
Now, said he to himself, I have no more to do. The door is shut and I can't open it. Before the words were rightly shaped in his own mind, a voice in his ear said to him, Search for the key on the top of the door or on the wall. He started. Who's that speaking to me? He cried, turning around, but he saw no one. The voice said in, ear, in his ear again, Search for the key in the top of the door or on the wall. Erica Bow says good afternoon. Volja Erica. And Marion has joined us on YouTube. Hello, Marion. You're very welcome along. What's that, says he, and the sweat running from his forehead. Who spoke to me? It's I, the corpse, that spoke to you, <laughs> said the voice. Can you talk, said Tyg. Now and again, says the corpse. <laughs> Tyg searched for the key and he found it on the top of the wall. He was too much frightened to say any more, but he opened the door wide and as quickly as he could, and he went in with the corpse on his back. It was as dark as pitch inside, but poor Tyg began, and poor Tyg began to shake and tremble. Mavanwe is creeping in quietly. Hello, Mavanwe. No, you're not. <laughs> Hello, everybody, says uh, Mavanwe. Light the candle, said the corpse. Light the candle, said the corpse. Tyg put his hand in his pocket and as well as he was able and drew out a flint and steel. He struck a spark out of it and lit a burnt rag he had in his pocket. He blew it until it made a flame and he looked round him. The church was very ancient and part of the wall was broken down. Jules Cousins is here as well. Hello, Jules Fulcher. The windows were blown in or cracked and the timber of the seats was rotten. There were six or seven old iron candlesticks left there still. And in one of these candlesticks, Tyg found the stump of an old candle and he lit it. He was still looking round him on the, on the strange and horrid place in which he found himself. When the cold corpse whispered in his ear, Bury me now, bury me now. There's a spade and turn the ground. Tyg looked from him. And he saw a spade lying beside the altar. Handy thing to have beside an altar when you're looking to bury someone. He took it up and he placed the blade under a flag that was in the middle of the aisle. And leaning all his weight on the handle of the spade, he raised it. <laughs> it's deadly, says Nora. <laughs> when the first flag was raised, it was not hard to raise the others near it. Not difficult, that. And he moved three or four of them out of their places. The clay that was under them was soft and easy to dig, but he had not thrown up more than three or four shovelfuls when he felt the iron touch something soft like flesh. He threw up three or more, four more shovelfuls from around it, and then he saw that it was another body that was buried in the same place. I'm afraid I'll never be allowed to bury the two bodies in the same hole, said Tyg in his own mind. You corpse, there on my back, says he. Will you be satisfied if I bury you down there? But the corpse never answered him a word. That's a good sign, said Tyg to himself. Maybe he's getting quiet. And he thrust the spade down in the earth again. Perhaps he hurt the flesh of the other body, for the dead man that was buried there stood up in the grave and shouted an awful shout. Hoo, hoo, hoo! Go, 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 or you're a dead, dead, dead man. And then... He fell back in the grave again. Tyg said afterwards that of all the wonderful things he saw that night, that was the most awful to him. His hair stood upright on his head like the bristles of a pig. The cold sweat ran off his face and then came a tremor all over his bones until he thought that he must fall. But after a while he became bolder. When he saw that the second corpse remained lying quietly there, and he threw in the clay on it again, and he smoothed it overhead, and he laid down the flags carefully as they had been before. It can't be that he'll rise up any more, said he. He went down the aisle a little farther and drew, drew near to the door and began raising the flags again, looking for another bed for the corpse on his back. He took up three or four flags and then put them aside, and then he dug the clay. 
He was not long digging until he laid bare an old woman without a thread upon her but her shirt. She was more lively than the first corpse, for he had scarcely taken any of the clay away from about her. But she sat up and began to cry, Ho, oh, you bollock, you bollock, you bollock, which means a clown. Where has he been that he got no bed? Poor Tyg drew back. And when she found that she was getting no answer, she closed her eyes gently, lost her vigour, and fell back quietly and slowly under the clay. Tyg did to her as he had done to the man. He threw the clay back on her and left the flags down overhead. He began digging again near the door, but before he had thrown up more than a couple of shovelfuls, he noticed a man's hand laid bare by the spade. By my soul, I'll go no farther than then, said he to himself. What use is it for me? And he threw the clay in again on it and settled the flags as they had been before. He left the church then and his heart was heavy enough, but he shut the door and locked it and left the key where he found it. He sat down on a tombstone that was near the door and began thinking. He was in great doubt what he should do. He laid his face between his two hands and cried for grief and fatigue, since he was dead certain at this time that he would never come home alive. He made another attempt to loosen the hands of the corpse that were squeezed round his neck, but they were the, the, but they were as tight as if they were clamped, and the more he tried to loosen them, the tighter they squeezed him. He was going to sit down once more when the cold, horrid lips of the dead man said to him, Karek Vad Vigoros, and he remembered the command of the good people to bring the corpse with him to that place if he should be unable to bury it where he had been. He rose up and looked about him. I don't know the way, he said. As soon as he had uttered the word, the corpse stretched out suddenly its left hand that had been tightened round his neck and kept it pointing out, showing him the road he ought to follow. Tyg went in the direction that the fingers were stretched and passed out of the churchyard. He found himself on an old, rutty, stony road and he stood still again, not knowing where to turn. The corpse stretched out its bony hand a second time and pointed out to him another road, not the road by which he had come when approaching the old church. Tyg followed that road and whenever he came to a path or road meeting it, the corpse always stretched out its hand and pointed with its fingers, showing him the way he was to take. Many was the crossroad he turned down, and many was the crooked boreen he walked, until he saw from him an old burying ground at last beside the road. But there was neither church nor chapel nor any other building in it. The corpse squeezed him tightly, and he stood. Bury me, bury me in the burying ground, said the voice. Tyg drew, drew over towards the old burying place and he was not more than about 20 yards from it when, raising his eyes, he saw hundreds and hundreds of ghosts, men, women and children, sitting on the top of the wall round about or standing on the inside of it or running backwards and forwards and pointing at him while he could see their mouths opening and shutting as if they were speaking, though he heard no word nor any sound amongst them at all. He was afraid to go forward, so he stood where he was, and the moment he stood, all the ghosts became quiet and ceased moving. Then Tyg understood that, that it was trying to keep him from going in that they were. He walked a couple of yards forward, and immediately the whole crowd rushed together towards the spot to which he was moving, and they stood so thickly together that it seemed to him that he, would, that he never could break through them even though he had a mind to try. But he had no mind to try it. He went back broken and dispirited, and when he had gone a couple of hundred yards from the burying ground, he stood again, for he did not know what way he was to go. He heard the voice of the corpse in his ear saying, Chample Ronan, and the skinny hand was stretched out again, pointing him out the road. As tired as he was, he had to walk, and the road was neither short nor even. The night was darker than ever, and it was difficult to make his way. Many was the toss he got, and many a bruise they left on his body. 
At last he saw Champel Ronan for, from him in the distance, standing in the middle of the burying ground. He moved over towards it and thought he was all right and safe when he saw no ghosts nor anything else on the wall, and he thought he would never be hindered now from leaving his load off him at last. He moved over to the gate, but as he was passing in, he tripped on the threshold. Before he could recover himself, something that he could not see seized him by the neck, by the hands and by the feet, and bruised him and shook him and choked him until he was nearly dead. And at last he was lifted up and carried more than a hundred yards from that place and then thrown down in an old dyke with the corpse still clinging to him. He rose up, bruised and sore, but feared to go near the place again, for he had seen nothing the time he was thrown down and carried away. You corpse, up on my back, said he. Shall I go over again to the churchyard? But the corpse never answered him. That's a sign you don't wish me to try again, said Tyg. He was now in great doubt as to what he ought to do when the corpse spoke in his ear and said, Imlog, father. Oh, murder, said Tyg. Must I bring you there? If you keep me long walking like this, I tell you, I'll fall under you. He went on, however, in the direction the corpse pointed out to him. He could not have told himself how long he had been going when the dead man behind suddenly squeezed him and said, There! Tyg looked from him and he saw a little low wall that was so broken down in places that it was no wall at all. It was in a great wide field in from the road and only for three or four great stones at the corner that were more like rocks than stones. There was nothing to show that there was either a graveyard or burying ground there. Is this Imlog, father? Shall I bury you here? said Tyg. Yes, said the voice. But I see no grave or gravestone, only this pile of stones, said Tyg. The corpse did not answer, but stretched out its long fleshless hand to show Tyg the direction in which he was to go. Tyg went on accordingly, but he was greatly terrified, for he remembered what had happened to him at the last place. He went on with his heart in his mouth, as he said himself afterwards. But when he came to within 15 or 20 yards of the little low square wall, there broke out a flash of lightning, bright yellow and red, with blue streaks in it, and went round about the wall in one course, and it swept by as fast as the swallow in the clouds, and the longer Tyg remained looking at it, the faster it went, till at last it became like a bright ring of flame around the old graveyard, which no one could pass without being burnt by it. Tyg never saw from the time he was born and never saw afterwards so wonderful or so splendid a sight as that was. Round went the flame, white and yellow and blue sparks leaping from it as it went. And although at first it had been no more than a thin narrow line, it increased slowly until it was at last a great broad band and it was continually getting broader and higher and throwing out more brilliant sparks till there was never a colour on the ridge of the earth that was not to be seen in that fire, and lightning never shone and flame never flamed that was so shining and so bright as that. Tyg was amazed. He was half dead with fatigue, and he had no courage left to approach the wall. There fell a mist over his eyes, and there came a suron on his head, and he was obliged to sit down upon a great stone to recover himself. He could see nothing but the light, and he could hear nothing but the whir of it as it shot round the paddock faster than a flash of lightning. As he sat there on the stone, the voice whispered once more in his ear, Kilbrija. And the dead man squeezed him so tightly that he cried out. He rose again, sick, tired, and trembling, and went forwards as he was directed. The wind was cold and the road was bad and the load upon his back was heavy and the night was dark and he himself was nearly worn out and if he had had very much farther to go he would have fallen dead under his burden. At last the corpse stretched out its hand and said to him Bury me there. This is the last burying place said Tyg in his own mind. 
And the little grey man said I'd be allowed to bury him in so some of them, so it must be this. It can't be. It, it can't be, but they let him in here. The first faint streak of the ring of day was appearing in the east. And the clouds were beginning to catch fire, but it was darker than ever, for the moon was set and there were no stars. Make haste, sorry, make haste, make haste, said the corpse. And Tig hurried forward as well as he could to the graveyard, which was a little place on a bare hill with only a few, pardon me, with only a few graves in it. He walked boldly in through the open gate and nothing touched him, nor did he either hear or see anything. He came to the middle of the ground and then stood up and looked round him for a spade or shovel to make a grave. As he was turning round and searching, he suddenly perceived what startled him greatly, a newly dug grave right before him. He moved over to it and looked down and there at the bottom he saw a black coffin. He clambered down into the hole and lifted the lid and found that, as he thought it would be, the coffin was empty. He had hardly mounted up out of the hole and was standing on the bank when the corpse, which had clung to him for more than eight hours, suddenly relaxed its hold of his neck and loosened, loosened its shins from around his hips and sank down with a plop into the open coffin. Tyg fell down on his two knees at the brink of the grave and gave thanks to God. He made no delay then, but pressed down the coffin lid in its place and threw in the clay over it with his two hands. And when the grave was filled up, he stamped and leaped on it with his feet until it was firm and hard, and then he left the place. The sun was fast rising as he finished his work, and the first thing he did was to return to the road and look out for a house to rest himself in. He found an inn at last and lay down upon a bed there and slept till night. Then he rose up and ate a little and fell asleep again till morning. When he awoke in the morning, he hired a horse and rode home. He was more than 26 miles from home where he was, and he had come all that way with a dead body on his back in one night. Isn't that the distance of a, a marathon? He did a marathon with a corpse on his back. All the people at his own home thought that he must have left the country, and they rejoiced greatly when they saw him come back. Everyone began asking him where he had been, but he could not tell anyone except his father. He was a changed man from that day. He never drank too much. He never lost his money over cards. And especially he would not take the world and be out late by himself on a dark night. He was not a fortnight at home until he married Mary, the girl he had been in love with. And it's at their wedding the sport was. And it's he was the happy man from that day forward. And it's all I wish that we may be as happy as he was. Kriach. Toshe Kriach Naha. <laughs> interesting story. Huh? Somebody somebody commented there that it was like a hero's journey. Very interesting that indeed. Yes, Donna Firer. Well seen, Donna. Uh, like a hero's journey. The cave you e fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. I'm sure Joseph Campbell would have loved that story. So there's a glossary, uh, and I think we knew most of the words. I mean, Aran is a stanza. A Kaylee is a visit in the evening. A wira uh, is a wira, as in Mary. Oh, Mary, an exclamation like the French dam. Rib, a single hair. Uh, a lock, a glack, a bundle or whisper, a little share of anything. A kippine is a rod or twig. A boreen, of course, is a small road or a lane. Boach or bodoch, a clown. Suron. Uh, is vertigo, dizziness. Avic is avic, my son, or rather, o son. Mick is the vocative of Mac. Ah, that was that was enjoyable. I thought there's one more. Uh, uh, we we have time for a poem actually, um, because there's lots of stuff in this wonderful collection of uh, stories and poems and lore. If I can find it now, that's the thing now, if I can find it. Ah, there's loads. There's loads more. Should this keep us going for many, many a night? How would you like me to read The Stolen Child by W.B. Yeats? <laughs> 
I, I can't ima- I can't imagine that it will be as lively and pantomimish, uh, uh, dramatic and entertaining as that uh, as that story that we just had. But um, uh, in a, it, it's something by way of contrast. We read several little snippets last night. And it would be nice to have more than just one. Yes, wonderful. Look, there are the answers straight away. I had a feeling. <laughs> Naomi says, fantastic reading. Gura Mahagata Anthony. Yeah, I enjoyed that. It's a bit, a, bit, a bit fun. Biddy early. Yes, indeed, Naomi. That's a very good suggestion, actually. That's a, something that we could do an episode on. Uh, I should be able to find information about Biddy early. Uh, suggestions. Uh, Biddy Early, and that's suggested by Naomi mm-hmm. Serafina. I think my phone might still be buzzing, is it? I didn't put it on silent, did I? No, I didn't. I, I just put it on vibrate. I apologize for that. Anyway, so this is this will finish out the episode. Um, yeah, enjoyed that. It's it's very different, isn't it, to reading reading the old mythical stories. There's so much whimsy and drama, you know. And you can imagine that sort of story being told in an old cottage before the days of electricity a century ago. You know, people gathered around in the night, especially in the winter, you know, especially around the time of Samhain. Uh, I think Kelly was the one that suggested we should have, we should be reading that on Halloween. Um, you know, that's the sort of story that would have made people afeared, you know, rightly afeared. Anyway, this is The Stolen Child, a poem by W.B. Yeats. Where dips the rocky highland of sleuth wood in the lake? There lies a leafy island where flapping herons wake. The drowsy water rats, there we've hid our fairy vats, full of berries and of reddest stolen cherries. Come away, O human child, to the woods and waters wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. Where the wave of moonlight glosses the dim grey sands with light, far off by farthest rosses, we foot it all the night. Weaving olden dances, Mingling hands and mingling glances till the moon has taken flight. To and fro we leap and chase the frothy bubbles while the world is full of troubles and is anxious in its sleep. Come away, O human child, to the woods and waters wild with a fairy hand in hand for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. Where the wandering water gushes from the hills above Glen Carr, in pools among the rushes that scarce could bathe a star, we seek for slumbering trout and whispering in their ears, we give them evil dreams. Leaning softly out, from ferns that drop their tears of dew on the young streams. Come, O human child, to the woods and waters wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. Away with us he's going, the solemn-eyed. He'll hear no more the lowing, of the calves on the warm hillside, or the kettle on the hob, sing peace into his breast, or see the brown mice bob round and round the oatmeal chest. For he comes, the human child, to the woods and waters wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than he can understand. Lovely. Really, really, really beautiful stuff. Oh, Yeats. Yeats. Yeah, marvellous. Just otherworldly, you know. 
Um, fabulous stuff. Fantastic. Oh, we're just about hitting the hour there now. Do you know uh, the song of Wandering Angus? I don't know the uh, uh, the uh, the Stolen Child. I actually don't know it by heart. Um, I know the other one. I need to learn more poetry. I like to be able to recite poetry. It's lovely to be able to do it. It's a great uh, it's a great skill. It's a great talent, isn't it? And when you think about the old bards and the years of training they had to go through and the huge, long, epic stories that they had to memorize and the poems and everything else, it really was fabulous. So anyway, I think we may be able to continue with the theme tomorrow night. I don't see why not. We had one story tonight, but as this is a compendium and it's out of copyright too, so there, there shan't be any issues around copyright, uh, I might be able to read a few short ones tomorrow and kind of keep, you know, I will keep it going. I think we'll keep it going. Everybody seems to be enjoying it anyway. Um, in the meantime, um, Irish Technical Thinker says, WB Yates is the GOAT, G-O-A-T, greatest of all time. Yeah, more, says Alwyn. Yes, so we're okay about doing more fairy stuff tomorrow night. Yeah. Well, it's a little bit different, isn't it? Um, but it's still very enjoyable. Uh, and, of course, it's a huge part of our uh, legacy, our, our spoken, our, our oral legacy, you know. Uh, somebody wants to know what book, I think. Uh, I'm reading from the Book of Fairy and Folk Tales of Ireland, which was uh, compiled by W.B. Yeats. It was originally published as two separate books Fairy and Folk Tales of the Irish Peasantry, 1888, and Irish Fairy Tales, 1892. But this is a combined uh, a volume. Uh, and some of them are like that one about Ty, Ty Go Kane. That was, um, you know, that, that was what, three quarters of an hour in the telling. Uh, there's a lot of shorter stories in it. Uh, but we'll mix and match tomorrow. We'll do some more because you all seem to be... Uh, yes, more poetry. We'll finish. We'll finish with... Um, the Song of Wandering Angus, if, if, if you want to see the most powerfully beautiful, stirring, magical, uh, soulful version of The Song of Wandering Angus, just, just uh, search for it on YouTube and watch Michael Gambon's reading of it, <laughs> set to the most wonderful imagery and the most beautiful music. But anyway, I'll close out by reciting... Uh, the Song of Wandering Angus as best I can. And I'll try not to do a Michael Gambon impression as I'm doing it. I went out to the hazel wood because a fire was in my head and cut and peeled a hazel wand and hooked a berry to a thread. And when white moths were on the wing and moth-like stars were flickering out, I dropped the berry in a stream and caught a little silver trout. When I had laid it on the floor, I went to blow the fire of flame, but something rustled on the floor and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossom in her hair who called me by my name and ran and faded through the brightening air. Though I am old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands, I shall find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hands and walk among long dappled grass and pluck till time and times are done. The silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun. Thank you, folks, and a very good night to you. Uh, remember to keep safe. Uh, in this current pandemic. Keep washing your hands and using hand sanitizer. Maintain your social distancing. Try and keep two metres apart outside. Wear a mask uh, that covers both your nose and your mouth as much as you possibly can if you're going to be interacting with other people, uh, wherever that may be. And we'll do more Yeats uh, poetry as well. Lots more because he's wonderful. And we may come back to AE. We have to come back to AE as well. In the meantime, have a great day wherever you are in the world or a great night. Have a great weekend. Keep yourself safe and sound. Come back to us again tomorrow evening for episode 88. In the meantime, don't forget YouTube 
Michael Gambon, The Song of Wandering Ingus. It is powerfully beautiful. You will not regret it. It is one of the most beautiful things you will ever see. In the meantime, Kolosov, have a sound sleep. Ikawa, Nadina Golair, Makhar Jagalair, or Fodon Dawan, all my friends around the world. Uh, and Slán Gafol, or in English, if you prefer, good night for now, or goodbye for now. Slán Gafol. Facebookers.